right, if you would turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is our final sermon in the Creation to Christ series. And uh, so this sermon is on Christ's return, right, uh, which is yet to come. Uh, and uh, this is titled, The Long, Longing for Christ's Return. So let me ask you, do you long for Christ's return? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, I, I think sometimes maybe we don't as we should, uh, but it is something we should certainly long for, isn't it? We should long for it. We, think, we should think about it often. Um, so another question to ask is, how often do you think of Christ's return? And, and when you do think about it, is, this, is it something that really excites you? Or perhaps it troubles you? Another question. Uh, do you ever encourage others with the promise of Christ's return? So these are questions that uh, you probably all know the right answers to, as indicated uh, with, from your first answer at least. You probably know the, the answers that should be expected of you. Um, but but I, I, do, I do think that oftentimes we may not align up as we should in our answers to these questions. Maybe we don't long for Christ's return as we should. We don't think about it as often as we should. And perhaps Christ's return doesn't even always excite us. Perhaps it even troubles us sometimes. I want, to, I want to change that this morning, or at least I want to set us on the right trajectory uh, so that we can honestly answer all those questions as we know that we should. So we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Just some quick context here. Um, Paul had come and, and taught in person the church here in, in Thessalonica. Gosh, that's, that's a that's a tough one to say. The Thessalonians. He had come and he he had he had taught the uh, Thessalonians, but it seems it seems as though they uh, had some misunderstandings, and, and they found themselves in, in great distress whenever um, some of their fellow believers had died and Christ had not yet returned. Because understand, they um, they had this expectation for Christ's imminent return. And so um, they, they weren't sure what, what was going to happen to, to those who had died. Because, again, they had um, not quite fully understood Paul's teaching. And so here in this letter to them, Paul, he's wanting to correct some of their misunderstandings. He's wanting to comfort them with, uh, with the hope of Christ's return. Um, not just for the living, but also for the dead. And so um, as we look at this text, uh, we're going to... Look at, in fact, three reasons why we should long for Christ's return. I'll give you those reasons here in a moment. Let's go ahead and read the text, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we will encourage one another with these words. Pray, Lord, that, um, that these words will be our hope, Lord, that, that we will long for Christ's return, and that that will change even the way that we live here in the present. We pray, Lord, that as we look at this passage, uh, by your Holy Spirit, you will guide us, that you will give us insight. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so three reasons we should long for Christ's return. Three reasons. And the first is, as I've already alluded, the first is that it is the hope of both the living and and the dead in Christ. The return of Jesus is the hope of, the, of both the living and the dead 
in Christ. And so let's just break this down and let's talk about the living. And that is us, right? I think I think we're all alive in here. Some of you sometimes don't look like you're alive, but I think I think we're all alive. So so uh, so this is it is the hope of the living and the dead. So first the living. Um, when uh, Blake was doing the truth time with the kids, I couldn't help but wonder what was going through some of their minds, thinking about the return of Christ. Because uh, I have to admit that as a child, I remember kind of being troubled by the thought of Christ's return. Um, am, am I the only one? I, I mean, if I am, that's, raise your hand if, if you've ever been troubled by that as a child or maybe even as an adult. Yeah, okay, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad that I'm not alone. It gives me some comfort. It also is, is good to know because I'm about to preach about this. So um, uh, that, is, that it shouldn't trouble us. It shouldn't trouble us. But it did. It troubled me as a child. Um, even as a teenager, right? I, I, I thought, you know, well, if, if, Jesus, if Jesus comes back now, I'm going to miss out on, on all these things that I'm looking forward to. I'm going to miss out on driving. I'm going to miss out on going to college and having a family and a career. And, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'd be great when Jesus comes back, but maybe he could wait until, you know, maybe the end of my life or, or maybe after I die. Um, I, was, I was kind of troubled by it. I, I, it, was, it was almost an inconvenience. And so... As a child, I, uh, I was out of step with John's closing words in the book of Revelation where he says, Come, Lord Jesus. Right? I, couldn't, I couldn't say that with, with the true conviction, with the true desire for Jesus to come. I wanted him, I wanted him to hold off. I couldn't sing with gusto what we just sang uh, in the song It Is Well, right? Oh, Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Um, you know, it, I, I wasn't there. And, and again, I, I imagine this is not only true for, for children, it's even true for adults. And, and maybe all of us at, at different times in our lives, um, maybe we're not able to say that we long for Christ's return as we should. I know that uh, as a child, I, I think the problem was twofold, and I think that this is often the same uh, for adults. My first problem was that I didn't love Jesus enough. I, I, I failed to see that Jesus was better. I thought, well, you know, I want to do, do all these things, and then maybe I can be with Jesus. I mean, goodness, if, if, if we really loved Jesus as we should... Um, wouldn't we want him to come as soon as possible so that we could be united with him in, in, in the way that we will talk about later in this text that we see always being with the Lord and uh, in a much more um, real and profound way than, than we are even now? Um, should, shouldn't, shouldn't we long for that? I, I think about you know the, the kids who are um, waiting for their, their dad to return home from active duty in the military and, uh, and you know, you, you've seen those, uh, maybe those videos on the internet where, where a father will come and, and surprise their child. And uh, maybe the child's in the middle of watching a TV show. Is he gonna say, oh, dad, wait, I, I wanna finish this TV show first. Wait, let me finish this and then, and then you can come. No, the child is thrilled, right? Uh, or, or whatever it might be. And, and so, so the, same, the same should be true for us, right? Uh, no, matter what, uh, no matter what we are doing at the time, no matter what hopes we have for our future, um, Jesus is better. And so, uh, so I think whenever we, we fail to long for Christ's coming, it might just be because we don't love Jesus as we should. And do we ever? I mean, we can always grow in our love for Jesus, can't we? And so, so we, we have to have a love for Jesus. So, so that was my first problem. Perhaps I didn't love Jesus as I should. The second problem I had in not longing for Christ's return was... I had this misconception that life after Christ's return would be devoid of all the blessings that we have in this life. It was almost as if I, I thought that Jesus would come and steal from me all the things that I looked forward to. Right? The Bible tells us that Jesus will come like a thief in the night. Right? But he's not coming to steal from us. Right? Um, he's coming to, to bring us endless joy. And so um, I think we have to recognize that. Maybe you've been to the Grand Teton Mountains. Raise your hand if you've seen the. All right. Raise your hand if you haven't, but you want to. All right. Yeah, I'm in that. I'm in that second category. 
Well, um, if Jesus comes back before you get to see the Grand Tetons, don't worry. Because there will be a better Grand Teton mountain range in the New Earth. And it will move us to worship far beyond what anything in this present world can. All right, so I just use that as, as an illustration that, um, you know, the, the life after Christ's return is we're not going to be floating on clouds, playing harps. It's not going to be some kind of drab uh, existence. We're not going to be singing in a church choir for a million years. Okay, um, We're going to experience the blessings of the new creation. And, and all the blessings that we have here on earth, I, I believe, will be magnified. And all the bad stuff will be taken away. Right? Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a restored creation where we dwell with Christ forever. And so we should not, we should not worry about missing out on anything in this life because uh, it's just going to be better in the life to come after Christ's return. And so um, Jesus' return is not a threat to us. It is our hope. It is the hope of both the living and the dead. And uh, oftentimes as we get older, we, we recognize that this world will disappoint us, don't we? Uh, maybe as maybe as children we we look forward to all these wonderful things and and yes there are many blessings in this life but as we get older we come to find that uh, that life can be really hard and that that life can really let us down and so that helps us see all the more clearly uh, that Jesus's return is our hope it's the hope of the living and the dead and so let's talk about the dead here um, the Thessalonians they were concerned about those who had fallen asleep, that is, those who had died, that they would perhaps miss out on Jesus' second coming. And then after Jesus' second, after Jesus' second coming, what? What would become of these who had died? There was a lot of confusion, and, and, and they had some turmoil. They, they, they didn't know what would happen. And so Paul gives the assurance that they will not miss out on Jesus' second coming. In fact, they will be first in line. Right? The dead in Christ will rise first. They will be first in line, and it will indeed include a resurrection of their bodies, right? So when Christ returns, the dead will be raised, and then those of us who remain, our bodies will be changed, and we will be in physical glorified bodies on a new earth for all eternity. That's a wonderful, wonderful promise. And so Paul gives them this assurance. And I want you to notice that there is a connection here with Jesus' own resurrection. In verse 14, he says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And then later on in the passage is where he tells us that the dead in, in Christ will, in fact, raise from the dead. And so it's because of Jesus' resurrection. Because Jesus was raised, we will be raised. And if we are still alive at his coming, we will be changed. And we will have a glorified body just like Jesus and just like those who have been raised. And so that is, uh, that is a wonderful promise that, uh, that Paul gives. And so he says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see that in verse 18, kind of the close of this, uh, of this chapter. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Right? He's encouraging the Thessalonians uh, about, in particular, those who had died. I wonder... Um, if, uh, if you ever do that, I ask at the beginning of the sermon, you know, do you ever encourage anybody um, with Jesus' second coming? But more specifically, what about those who have had a loved one that has died? Do you encourage them about Christ's second coming, about the resurrection of the dead? Um, this is something, if, 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 you've, uh, if you've been here very long, you know that uh, I can kind of get on a soapbox about this. And, and, and I, I preached about this quite a bit when we were going through 1 Corinthians 15. And that is that uh, you know, oftentimes we, we just simply talk about heaven, about, about this, what we call the intermediate state. Right? That is, that is the, the time period between a person's death and Christ's second coming. Right, that's the intermediate state, where we're in heaven with the Lord, but it's a, a purely spiritual realm. And, and so someone dies, and, and you say, oh, well, they are in heaven, and they're with the Lord. And oftentimes, that's all you ever hear talked about, is they're in heaven now, as if that's the end. Even in funeral sermons, 
I often hear the, the pastor just simply talk about how this, this person is now with the Lord. And there's nothing at all ever mentioned about the resurrection of the dead at Jesus' coming. That's a, that's a problem. It, it just doesn't seem to fit with the emphasis that we see in Scripture. And so even here in 1 Thessalonians 4, he's comforting them with the resurrection of the dead at Christ's coming. Now it is true that if, if one is to die before Jesus returns, that you will go to be with the Lord, right? Paul says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And so you will be in heaven with God, and it will be wonderful. And that is a very comforting thing, right? We should be comforted by that. When a loved one dies, we can be comforted that, uh, that their soul is now in heaven with God. Uh, but God did not mean for our soul and our body to be divorced from one another eternally. Um, he created us body and soul, and at his coming, our bodies will be raised and reunited with our souls for all eternity. And that is how God intended it, and that is, and that is what is uh, the very best for us. And so, um, the intermediate state, right, uh, this um, spiritual realm between our death and Christ's return, that is not, that is not the main event. And so we shouldn't talk about it as if it's the main event. We should encourage one another with these words that Christ will return and the dead will be raised. And so we see a, a dead body in a casket here in this church building. Yes, we're comforted. We're comforted that they are with the Lord right now, but even more so, we are comforted that that dead body will be raised at Christ's return and live on a new earth for all eternity. And so it seems to me that uh, um, in, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe, just in, maybe this is just a Western world thing and then evangelicalism today that, that uh, um, a lot of us are maybe out of balance biblically. And I think maybe it goes hand in hand with a lack of, of a hopeful longing and expectation for Christ's return. Because if we really had this hopeful longing and expectation for Christ's return, if that was on the forefront of our minds, then we wouldn't um, focus on the intermediate state at the expense of Christ's return and the resurrection of the dead. But Christ's return and the resurrection of the dead would in fact be front and center, just as we see it is um, with uh, with Paul here, and then we see it throughout the New Testament. And so, um, may we not find ourselves lacking in this hopeful longing and expectation for Christ's return. May we recognize that it is the hope of both of the living and the dead. Paul writes to Titus, Titus 2.13, he says, We await our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus' return, that is our hope. And we must, we must always have that on the forefront of our minds. We must have a longing for it. Um, because it is, it is good. It is good. So number two, second reason we should long for the return of Christ and that it will unite believers to one another and to Christ in perfect eternal fellowship. Right? That is when Christ returns, us believers, we're going to be united together, and not just us, but all believers from all of, from, from all of um, history will be united together and united to Christ in perfect eternal fellowship. So first, just real briefly, um, being united to one another. Think about this. This is the living and the dead, the first of God's redeemed all the way to the last, right? Um, that's pretty incredible to think of, to think of this, this fellowship of believers. Just, just a, a couple of weeks ago, we were, talk, we were looking in Acts chapter 2 and, and reading about the fellowship of believers in the early church. Well, think about how wonderful this fellowship will be when all of believers from all of human history will be together with the Lord pretty incredible. Uh, look again in verses 16 through 17. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Notice the um, collective language there, especially in verse 17. Um, we'll be caught up together with them, right? So, so we who are alive will be caught up together with those who are dead. Um, and, and, and this will include, again, believers from the very beginning to the very end. We'll be caught up together with them. And so we will be with the Lord always. Um, that's an incredible thought. And moreover, we learn as, as, uh, uh, as we look further into Scripture and in Revelation, we're, we're told that, that this will include people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. All, right, all, of, all of these will be represented in the end at Christ's coming. So that's an incredible thought. So we'll be united to one another. Uh, but um, most wonderful of all, we will be united to Christ. Right, so the end of verse 17. And so we will always be with the Lord. Believer, does that not sound like the most wonderful thing in the world? Right? We will always be with the Lord. Um, that is what his coming ultimately means for us. This, this uh, union with Christ. Now you may ask, um, given that there is one risen Jesus and countless millions who have been redeemed, what does it even mean that we're always going to be with the Lord? Will we even have access to him? Have, have you thought about that before? Right? That there's, there's one risen Jesus, right? and, and you realize he is in a physical body. Even now, he, is, he rose physically from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and when he comes back, he will come back as the risen Jesus in a physical body. So if there's just if there's one risen Jesus and there's countless millions of people who uh, who will be in the new heavens and the new earth with him, I mean, are we even going to get a get a glimpse at him? What's what's that going to be like? Um, those are some good questions. Before giving a uh, an answer to this question, I'll say that um, besides besides the physical presence of Jesus, um, of course. Uh, even now he's present with us in spirit and, and I can only imagine um, how that will be amplified in the new heavens and the new earth uh, the spiritual presence of Christ uh, so, so for example um, well I'll, I'll leave it at that but uh, let, me, let me give, a, let me give a, a possible answer from Randy Alcorn so I'm going to read this and you put on your thinking caps here and follow closely uh, but this, this, is, this is an answer that Randy Alcorn, uh, who's written a lot about, uh, about heaven, uh, that is in particular the new heavens, the new earth, um, he's written about this and he's, he's pondered this question about, okay, there's one risen Jesus and there's countless millions of people. So, you know, are you going to get to go fishing with Jesus? Are you going to get to walk around and talk with him? Or is he going to be too busy, you know, with, with other people or doing other things? Um, here's a thought. He says, because the resurrected Christ is both man and God, the issue of whether he can be in more than one place at the same time involves a paradox, not only in the future, but also in the present. On the one hand, Jesus is a man, and a man is finite and limited to one location. But on the other hand, Jesus is God, and God is infinite and omnipresent. In a sense, then, one of these truths has to yield somewhat to the other. I suggest that perhaps Christ's humanity defined the extent of his presence in the first coming and life on earth, humanity thereby trumping deity by limiting omnipresence. That's a mouthful. Let me stop there and clarify if you're confused. He's saying, you know, when Jesus came to earth, when Jesus took on human flesh, he was in only one place at one time, right? He had this limitation. Here on earth. And so he says that um, in Jesus' first coming on earth, it seems that uh, in regards to being one place, more than one place at one time, that his humanity, uh, or that his deity yielded to his humanity. Okay, so I'll read, I'll read that again. It says, I suggest that perhaps Christ's humanity defined the extent of his presence in the first coming and life on earth, humanity thereby trumping deity by limiting omnipresence. 
But Christ's deity may well define the extent of his presence in his second coming and life on the new earth. That is, deity thereby trumping the normal human inability to be in two places at once. Jesus has and always will have a single resurrected body in keeping with his humanity. Yet that body glorified may allow him a far greater expression of his divine attributes than during his life and ministry on earth. So suffice it to say, he's suggesting that perhaps in, in, in the, the new earth, that, that Jesus will be able to manifest himself um, in more than one place at one, in more than one time, even though he does, in fact, still have one resurrected body. And so it's confusing. It's, it's mysterious. And we, we don't have um, any clear answers. This is speculation. But I think we can at least be sure that being with the Lord will not disappoint. Right? I mean, that is the essence of the eternal life that is to come. That we will be with the Lord. And so, um, however that works out, we won't be disappointed. In fact, I mean, even, even if we had restricted access to Jesus, that is, uh, the risen Jesus in his resurrected body, right? If we had this restricted access to, to him, we'll consider this. We would have all eternity to take our turns to, uh, to walk and to talk with him, to go fishing with him, or whatever we might want to do. Um, because whenever our time is limitless, well, uh, a thousand years is like a day. So that would be another route that we could take. Um, but again, I mean, we, we, we see in the New Testament that, that there is this longing for Christ's return. There is this longing to be with Jesus. So whatever that might look like, again, it will not disappoint. And so therefore, we should encourage one another with these words. Verse 18. And so let me give you now the third reason. The third reason that we should long for Christ's return. And that is because it is our salvation. Okay? So it is the hope of the living and the dead in Christ. It will unite believers to one another into Christ in perfect eternal fellowship. And then thirdly, it is our salvation. What does that mean? Uh, salvation from, from what in particular? Well, salvation from the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God is something that uh, maybe often we might feel ashamed to talk about, uh, in this culture at least. Um, but understand, Jesus was not ashamed to talk about his wrath. And the New Testament writers, they were not ashamed to talk about his wrath. And I think sometimes whenever we see um, some of the terrible things that go on in this world, um, maybe it kind of snaps us back into reality and we realize, you know what? Um, the wrath of God is, is a, a good and necessary thing. But of course, um, we don't want to be on the other end of it, do we? And we won't be, because Christ's coming is our salvation. This requires us to go into chapter 5. So we're going to move on to chapter 5 a little bit here. Let me read just these first three verses. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. All right, so we see this uh, vivid picture here of what is to come, the sudden destruction, the wrath of God at Christ's coming. I mentioned that, uh, you know, sometimes we, we see uh, things on the news and we see just um, the depravity of this world. And really, you only have to, we don't have to look at the news. Um, sometimes we just have to look in the mirror. Um, but we see the depravity of this world and we, we um, maybe get this sense that, that God's wrath is building up against this world and all of its ungodliness. And we're right to think that because that's exactly what Paul is saying here. But praise God that uh, he doesn't stop there in verse 3. He doesn't stop there in verse 3 with this destruction from which um, many will not escape. 
but he continues on. And so let's read verses, beginning in verse 4. He says, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that together, so that so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Now the awake or the, or the asleep there, I think, uh, is clearly referring to um, whether we are dead or alive, or alive or dead, respectively. Just as in chapter 4, he's uh, written about those who have fallen asleep. So we see a wonderful promise here um, that even though wrath and judgment is coming, even though destruction is coming, and that is a warning to all of those who are outside of Christ, but the comfort to those of us who are in Christ is that we are not destined to wrath, but that we will be saved from this at the Lord's coming. Wonderful, wonderful promise. Now, it is important for us to recognize, as we look at uh, Thessalonians 4, as we move into 1 Thessalonians 5, it's important for us to recognize that um, how you understand these two chapters is going to correspond with whatever end-time system you hold to. So I'm going to spend the next hour now talking about, <laughs> talking about the, the, the different uh, eschatological systems. And uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be very brief on this, okay? Um, but it is important for us to understand that, that it does affect how you might read uh, a passage like this. And so, and so the, the different theories go from very, very simple to very, very complex. Okay? So, so a, a, a simple way of understanding this, um, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, would be that in 1 Thessalonians 4, it is the second coming of Christ, full stop. Right? It is Christ's second coming, and that's it. And then 1 Thessalonians 5 is the final judgment which takes, which takes place immediately following us meeting Christ in the air, right? So, so Christ comes, we meet him in the air, and then we have the day of the Lord in chapter 5, the judgment. All right, so that's um, pretty simple. But then uh, it can also get really complex in other systems. And so um, one system that's popular today um, would suggest that there are essentially two comings of Christ at the end. There's a coming for the church, and then there's a coming with the church, right? So for the church and with the church. So the coming for the church would be what uh, many people call the rapture, right? Uh, that, um, uh, so 1 Thessalonians 4, you know, the church is raptured, um, and, and, and they are then taken to heaven for a period of seven years during the tribulation. Right? So if you've watched the Left Behind series, that's, that's, uh, this is the system that Left Behind. Uh, really, the, the system first came about in uh, the mid-1800s by a guy named John Nelson Darby. It was a Schofield Bible that uh, popularized it, and then it was uh, most recently popularized by Left Behind. So the idea is that Christ raptures the church, so, so that would be, uh, well, it's, it's described as his coming here in 1 Thessalonians 4. He raptures the church. And then it's just tribulation, um, which so that's the beginning of a more extended period called the Day of the Lord. And then Christ comes again, but with the church, to set up his millennial reign, like a literal thousand-year reign on earth. And then it's after that that finally judgment comes. Okay, so you see that would be a lot more complex system than the first. And, so, and, and then and there, are, there are many other positions in between, it can be quite mind-boggling just to try to understand all of these different theories. I do lean uh, toward the more simple explanation. It's not just because it's easier, but because I do believe that it's um, better supported by Scripture, and it is a more historic position. Uh, that is the one that I described of First of, uh, Thessalonians four, 
uh, just simply being Christ's return, full stop, and then 1 Thessalonians 5 being the judgment that immediately um, comes after. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I lean, but I admit this is not easy, and it no doubt requires a humble and deep study of God's Word. And actually, I would challenge you, because uh, I've, I've bounced back and forth between different theories, I would challenge you, if you've held the, whole, this, the same theory your whole life, I don't know, perhaps you're just a really good interpreter or you have a lot of confidence, but maybe it's because you haven't looked deeply enough into the issues here, um, because it is, um, there, there's, there's a lot there to, to, to study. But let me close with this. Um, you know, eschatology or, or end times. Uh, some, some people are really fascinated with it. Other people have, want to have nothing to do with it. Um, uh, and for, for, some, for some, it can become a really big point of contention, right? So you have to hold to uh, this exact system or, or else you're unorthodox. Well, um, if, if you study church history and, and, and you know all of, the, all of the issues at hand, I, I, think, I think it's pretty clear that we, that we have to show <laughs> some grace to, uh, to people of, of various positions when it comes to the end times. And that ultimately, that this should not be something that is a point of contention Right? Uh, people who have different theories of, of the order of events and so on. It should not be a point of contention because after all, what does Paul say again here in chapter 11, now verse, of, of, or, or chapter, verse 11 of chapter 5? He says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. So we have again this, this, um, this call for us to encourage one another with the coming of the Lord, just as we saw in chapter 4, right? Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so um, the, the second coming of Jesus, um, it shouldn't be something that, uh, that we, we get uh, dogmatic about uh, the order of events and we have contention among our, our, um, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ about the particulars, but rather the second coming of Christ is something that we should encourage one another in. And, uh, and that brings us full circle to um, what I said at the very beginning of this sermon, uh, to this question, do you encourage others with the second coming of Christ? Whether it is uh, you know, the, the loss of a loved one, or perhaps if they're just going through a bad time, you know, say, you know what, Jesus is going to return, he's going to make all things right. And let's pray that he comes sooner than later. Let's long for Christ's return. Do you do that? I, I think that that's a good practice um, that we see modeled for us here by Paul. It is quite encouraging that we are not destined for wrath, as is the rest of the world. That's an encouraging thing, isn't it? As we see uh, the way this world is going, as, as, as we think about the wrath of God building up against this world, uh, we know that, that we are not destined for such wrath. We know that we have salvation through Christ and that that salvation will be fully realized at his return. At his return, we will be saved from judgment and we will be finally glorified. Our sanctification will be complete and we will be made perfect and we will have a perfect body. We will dwell with Christ forever. And so Christ's coming is our salvation. As, as we've seen, it's, it's even so much more than that. And so may we long for this. May we long for Christ's coming. And may we be ready. Let's pray.